It's also the first time that we have a corporation. So it's a corporation with women leaders for planetary health, with women in global health Germany, and with the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam. And we hope that in the future, we have many more corporations with many exciting, great people. And it's the first time that we focus on gender issues and also on planetary health. Both is very, very important for our work. And um, we will have, uh, we'll have a start a, a planetary health lecture series to reach to the whole German health sector in, on 13th of May. So it will be a nine lecture series and uh, we invite you all to join. I think it will be a great, great event and we hope to have many, many more meetings like this. Also Nicole and potentially Mike and others will join the lecture series that is starting in May. And now I hand over to you, Nicole. And uh, just for the uh, rest of the session, we have inputs now for about 45 minutes and we will have a 15 minutes breakout session for you to exchange and discuss and jointly reflect. And then we come back to plenary and you have time to kind of express your comments, your ideas, and mostly Nicole and Mike will respond to the ideas and we will have a discussion and probably end around 7.30. So hand over to you, Nicole. Very exciting to have you. And you may introduce yourself just very briefly. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Martin and everyone for joining. It's, you know, difficult times. We are adjusting to new logistics and it's very inspiring to be at home and be together. It's this alone together with so many inspiring people still trying to, uh, you know, drive some change. So I will do, uh, I'll share my screen here. So if something happens, I'll not see in the chat. So please uh, rescue, but um, here we go. So um, uh, hopefully it's working. Yes? Great. So close here. All right, so it's, well, the title that we now, that we decided, um, right, Martin, together, is this building resilience and promoting planetary health. And the relevance of gender just solutions in times of COVID-19 uh, is pretty much, I think we hear, you know, it's every minute or whatever phrase we have, we have COVID-19. So we thought it was important to um, address this topic uh, through these lenses of planetary health. So I'm Nicole de Paolo. I'm the class top for the first class top for sustainability fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies uh, uh, on Sustainability, ISS, here in Potsdam. And uh, I'm also the founder of the Women Leaders of Planetary Health. And I will explain a, a little bit about that. So, yes. So, for today, um, I decided to divide this conversation in three main parts. Is really tell the story of how we came with this idea of this women leaders of planetary health, uh, discuss a little bit of this impact of COVID-19 from this perspective of uh, uh, gender and planetary health, and uh, why do we believe that planetary health is really the way forward, uh, trying to, especially in this post-COVID uh, world. Uh, I want to start then, why to focus on the planetary health, because that's an expression that I see some people here are very familiar with, and, but not everybody. So this planetary health really, uh, as a concept, refers to the health of human civilization and the state of natural systems on which it depends. That's a definition that came uh, out of this uh, um, big, uh, big report uh, done by the Rockefeller Foundation, the Lansom Commission on Planetary Health, uh, long in 2015 and that really is driving a community together and I would recommend uh, if you're more very interested in planetary health and uh, and there is this article that was constructed we have here uh, three main authors but really it was a, an effort of a group this planetary health education brainstorm group that I also participated and this cross-cutting principles for planetary health education that's something that really gives a lot of broad perspective and some of these principles, we outlined at 12 there in this paper, but uh, for example, um, one of the research questions that we're trying to address as a group now, and as Martin said, uh, on this uh, gender lenses of planetary health, was really, um, so planetary health is trying to build, it's not only a discipline and trying to evolve as a discipline, but it's also building a social movement. And of course, we think that gender is a very important aspect. Uh, avoiding bias, 
in analysis, improving governance, improving communication of science, uh, apply systems thinking, and having transdisciplinary, and uh, take a look at unintended consequences uh, when you're trying you know, to design your policies, and also look at cultural identities. So if you see uh, this, just part of this principle, it's very an important uh, departing point for the role of gender uh, in relation to the search for sustainable solutions. So that's the, one of the things that we are trying to address. And how can we promote more equitable, sustainable development, especially in times of COVID-19, uh, climate crisis, and especially also that's something we tend to forget, the unprecedented uh, biodiversity degradation. And, and how the social movement can accelerate this transformation. So the way that we have these conversations, I would like to also, for, for those who are not familiar with, to, I would encourage you to visit the planetaryhealthalliance.org. Uh, following this report that I mentioned, uh, we had uh, this, with the support of Rockefeller Foundation, the creation of the Planetary Health Alliance. And we are now in, in only four years, more than 200 institutions and over in 40 countries. And, and I, we still think it needs to reach out to, and be more diverse. And that's the part, my favorite part here, because it's to tell a little bit of the story uh, that we had with this Women Leaders of Planetary Health. Uh, I see that some of the people here in the call were at this moment here in this photo on the right. But um, so just to put it briefly, our mission is to try to bridge these gaps between environment and health policies through the gender solutions. Uh, I think it's, there are many options out there that could be even um, potentialized. But how this happened was um, I, before um, early 2019, I was invited to give a talk, uh, the, um, the Global Female Leaders Forum here in Berlin that happens every May, not this year, but, uh, and they are really trying to become the Davos of women. So it's a very business oriented uh, audience. And, and I was invited to speak there and I brought the theme of planetary health. And I was very surprised how um, the business sector also embraced this notion. And it was very encouraging to see because, uh, and that's I think Martin also agree, if you, if you want to drive change, it's so important to be out of our comfort zones and to reach out to, uh, to different communities than normally, if you're a medical student, you're probably gonna be with, you know, people in medicine and I'm a, I'm, my background is in international relations. So I, you know, I'm, I'm mostly with people doing foreign policy, but I truly believe that we need to break the silos of, of knowledge and try to influence these other areas. So um, after that meeting, it was exciting to see the, um, the participation of the private sector. And then uh, I'll make the story short, but I ended up in Rwanda at, at this meeting of this Women Leaders in Global Health 2019. And this photo is just, the longer story is in a blog that you can find at ISS, that's the title here on the left. Um, but the important thing, uh, thing is that when I went to Kigali, and this is a photo of the first lady of, Ru of Rwanda, it was a very exciting meeting. We had more than a thousand people, uh, women and men, uh, supporting the issue of increasing the leadership of women in global health. And I was very inspired by this meeting. And at the same time, there was also a, a sense of that, I think it opened my eyes for a, a space and a, an opportunity to really discuss more the issue of health, but from the perspective of this planetary health. And I think uh, even though the meeting was so big, there was still people um, asking for uh, more discussions on this topic. We had only one panel, for example, on climate change. Uh, and I thought, well, there's really an appetite for discussing it more. And because I'm at ISS, and which is a great uh, opportunity now um, to really bridge science and policy, that's uh, this position being the first class software fellow, I think it gives me an opportunity to be, try to be innovative. And we had this idea to launch this dialogue at the UN Climate Summit in December. Uh, in Madrid, and that was uh, we had this a small space there, but it was also the you know the, the 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 biggest session that we had in our space. And as you can see, also with uh, strong support, our mayor directors Mark Lawrence and some people also from the UN and the Asia Stephens photo who also supported us there, and uh, uh, parts of the people who will speak here today. And it was really an idea to co-create a space for dialogue and see if there was an appetite for this. And then we definitely concluded that there was an appetite and that's why we moved forward. So if you take the, the, the times we live now, it's, we are on the Anthropocene, it's like humans are this geological force, we are destroying our planet, you see it every day. So if in, in times of when you need innovative solutions, we also need new leaders and we need leaders that bring the perspective of you know, the mix of planetary health and sustainability. 
because we are also the first uh, generation to be aware of the threats and probably the last generation who really can take action. So we, we, we are truly convinced that we need this fresh approach to sustainable development and public health policies. And that's what we're trying to do. And one of, I think that COVID-19 really exposes the fragilities that we are seeing in the way that we develop in our unsustainable development. And, um, but another thing that we really concerns me from Brazil that we definitely need also to be more inclusive and in bringing the global South to this conversation. So the problems we see is that, of course, it doesn't matter if you're in business, if you're you know, in academia, uh, it's still women fail to secure leadership positions and participate at all levels of decision making, and especially in the South. So that's something that needs to change. If you take uh, into account the universal roadmap uh, for development now, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We see that we are not on track, especially for the environmental targets. We're not on track for gender equality. And uh, so definitely there is, um, uh, there is more effort that we need to do there. Uh, and we believe that gender equality is really part of the solution, it's a big part of the solution. Um, so we want to demonstrate in this coalition, Women Lose Voluntary Health, we're trying to see how do we uh, make this linkage more visible? How we can help to implement the sustainable development goals through these lenses? And how could we train women, specifically in the South, to also lead planetary health solutions? And you know, it could be in teaching, could be in, in designing new policies. There, there is just uh, many opportunities there. And of course, we want to ensure that women would also improve their soft skills that um, when you circulate in different um, areas you see that normally uh, many uh, it's, there is a very common concern the women they, they they feel that they are also not trained because of cultural perceptions could be or norms so that's something that needs to be addressed so just to hear gender solutions are usually cost effective fair and address root causes of unsustainable development but yet we stay, we see that they remain overlooked. And I, and especially, and still even in the planetary health community, we, you feel that sometimes you need to push that discussion there. So we definitely, I think we exist to uh, increase cooperation, to decrease existential risks, and especially for women. And of course, the first key message here is we work to make things visible, visible in policy making, and this will only happen if we do this together. So moving to this COVID-19 story that we are now all experiencing is definitely a stress test. We, we, all the plans we are you know, making and they are now on hold, but we see that we are learning to do things differently. So uh, viruses have no borders. Uh, uh, I like that in California, it was the governor said they don't take vacations on a sunny day. Uh, they don't discriminate against ethnicity, age, gender but um, they are more successful in communities that are more vulnerable. I think we can only start to imagine, uh, you know, in areas when you cannot, you don't have access to water, or you cannot self-isolate because, you know, you, you live in a slum and Brazil, for example, has a very, you know, large number of what we call the favelas. So it's definitely uh, difficult. And preliminary research or studies and some data that we have, uh, they're showing that um, for the first time, women are not in disadvantage uh, regarding to the COVID risks and uh, men seem to be uh, more at risk. But if you take a step forward, you see that's half of the story. And I want to highlight probably you know, more reasons, but there are four major points here that why COVID-19 affects women disproportionately. The first is that the majority of health workers are females. And that's what I've been, you know, is when I go to these meetings, uh, on women leadership in global health. That's uh, number one concern that they show. They're, they're really the majority, but when it comes to the leadership, uh, their voices are not there. Uh, and then we have the second point is the double burden of care. Normally, uh, in many, many places, women are now having a very heavy journeys with their work, but they come back home and they also have to normally the expected roles in society that they take care of their children, they take care of the elderly. So it's really a lot of work uh, for uh, women comparatively. And you have here uh, this part on the left, it doesn't, you can access, it's very interesting that you could click if you go to one world in data, they give you the time, uh, the average data of, you know, that women work in the specific countries. So also uh, uh, migration workers uh, are really, especially in Southeast Asia, um, some of them you know, are deprived from, they cannot go back home, they're trapped, and also they are not having 
uh, helping their families back home. So that's, uh, and most of them, there's a lot of women also affected by this problem. Um, and the most unacceptable one, which is really this increasing violence of all types. And this, it's really in also in developed countries. I'm now in Germany and, and, and we are receiving internal emails, for example, showing how uh, the number of calls to the police are increasing because of aggression against women. So that's very, also this is a map that would discuss this um, more closely. Um, what is also interesting and that if you go to, we need to learn faster because these topics that we are addressing and that a lot of women uh, who advocate for you know, more equality in the health sector, they're showing that's not the first time we are having, uh, you know, that women are at dis disadvantaged. You have the experience in, uh, with the Ebola crisis in West Africa, um, when you have, for example, when women were excluded from decision making, uh, they had the resources that were supposed to go for reproduct uh, reproductive and sexual health. It ended up in emergency responses and just the women needs uh, ended up ignored. But I would like to mention more also the case of Zika because that's what I'm more familiar with. Being Brazil, it was a really hot spot uh, for, the, for the outbreak. Uh, and it was really during the Olympics when, so this I think it caught a lot of attention globally because a lot of people were expected to go to Brazil. Uh, and then also the number of women who are really affected uh, by the problem of Zika, they were concentrated in low income areas. Uh, so of course, and I remember clearly that one of the solutions people were just, um, a, a lot of people just driving, uh, maybe moving to Miami to, you know, having their babies or continue the pregnancy, which is obviously not a choice for all of them. So if you see that in, in summary, that the gender is really a determinant of health, and there is a gender blind spot in global health governance. So far, we see in this uh, public health emergencies uh, before, it's happening now. Uh, and then we think that there is a need to responses must adequately address the socioeconomic options to evaluate women's choice. As I said, it's not really a choice to be uh, flying to Miami, for example. So in the third part and final one, it's so why is it urgent to bring this planetary health to um, what I call a new development paradigm? And there is also a text here I can share with you all. If you're interested, just send me, um, uh, we can be in contact to send more material. Because one of the main uh, problem here, why is it urgent? We, we do see some um, progress, you know, overall health progress. And I'm just here, one example is maternal um, health. Uh, we see that improved in, in many regions of the world. Um, however, uh, we see that the, the, the state of the planet is really uh, decreasing. So I think that the main point of this planetary health movement is to show, even though we have made some progress, the paradox is we are not at tipping points that would just reduce, we would lose this progress uh, that, and I think with the COVID-19 now is really an uh, important point that we're probably gonna see the, the, in the post-crisis, how much we're gonna lose in terms of poverty reduction or inequalities uh, reduction or uh, pollution reduction. So these are concerns. And of course, with billions of people around the world, the, the, the increase of food, energy and water, what we call the nexus, uh, it's something that we cannot sustain if we keep doing business and moving forward with business as usual. So we definitely need to be, you know, this transformative development agenda that is gender just and that works for people and the planet. And it's very interesting now to see a change in, in the climate movement, for example, when you see uh, this week is happening here, a dialogue on climate, the Petersburg dialogue, and everyone now is calling, you know, an agenda for people and the planet. So it's really not about uh, just making it, it's not about climate change, it's not about biodiversity loss, and I think that's something that have, uh, has been bothering me a little bit in terms, people try to make it hierarchies of problems, and that's uh, an issue that we have to combat now. And I, and I like the planetary health narrative exactly for trying to bring this together. Because um, and we see that some of these key plan solutions for health, they're not necessarily inside the hospital. We will need this functional democracies that right now we're seeing a lot of problems in key Western democracies. Uh, we need leaders to be accountable and we need partnerships. I don't think there is not one single discipline that will have the monopoly of the solution for what we're going um, uh, through now. So I think COVID-19 could be some sort of a gift and it's hard to say that, but uh, to change and rethink these rules of reality 
because we're going to have to come back and rebuild back much uh, better. So uh, I think most of you have seen this photo that appeared it was a meme first and went on an article of Forbes and there was this discussion of who wrote this article. But uh, the point is that I think they wanted to show that women care and that's why women's leadership has a potential to be transformative. And uh, I think COVID-19 and recovery uh, seems to be better in countries, of course, where women are leading. Uh, we know that this current crisis is still um, in many other countries that we don't have the chance to my own country, Brazil, uh, we're seeing uh, it's every day when you watch the news, it's, it's even hard to describe because it, it looks really like a joke that people, how the, the, the government is, is leading uh, this debate right now there. So our task would be to make sure this care economy, as well as this green finances, are prioritized to achieve a fair and equitable transition towards planetary health for all. And that's on this conclusion on the for all, it's very important because uh, we wanted to maybe give in, in the spirit of the sustainable development goals is the motto is leave no one behind. So I wanna close with an invitation. Uh, I have the pleasure and honor to be part of the organizing committee of the next planetary health annual meeting that will take place in Brazil in April, 2021. Uh, who knows if COVID allows, but uh, we are very, I think we can, we are definitely, I'm, I think I want a, a very important part of this also to take care of this um, gender aspect and that uh, I would like to invite all of you to be part of this community, to join forces and, and, and it's really important that we get out of our uh, comfort zones to uh, bridge communities. So I think it means that everybody is really uh, invited. So with that, I think uh, I'll give back it to you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicole, for this very inspiring and far-reaching um, lecture. So I hand over to Kathleen. I will. Yep, I think I have successfully unmuted myself. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to say a few words here. My name is Kathleen Marr. I often go by Katie, and I'm part of the executive team at Women Leaders for Planetary Health, and I'm also the team leader for climate at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies, ISS, in Potsdam. Um, in just a few minutes here, I wanted to take a little time to say just a little commentary on the German response to COVID and how that can be viewed in light of uh, criteria for gender equity and gender justice. Um, we just heard Nicole giving a global perspective and arguing that um, in crisis response, in the COVID-19 response, that uh, governments are largely ignoring the gender di dimension and that there's this gender blind spot in global health governance. And I will argue that in the case of Germany, this is also the case. And um, many, including Nicole, have also then praised Germany and its COVID response. I think it has also done a lot of things well, but I want to just raise one specific aspect uh, regarding Germany's response that I see as not gender just. So if we rewind to about two weeks ago, the German national government uh, presented its first plan for how to reopen uh, social and economic life after the COVID lockdown. And in this first plan, uh, the first businesses to reopen are shops that are small, so less than 800 square meters, plus um, auto, the auto industry is allowed to start reselling cars, so um, car dealerships, Autohäuser, are allowed to reopen even if they're larger as well as bicycle shops. In this first plan, there was also an idea about how to reopen schools for children with priority given to uh, classes that needed to graduate. But what wasn't even mentioned in this first development of the national plan were children that were under school age, so children that go to kita or daycare. Um, this is also something that affects me personally. I have a two-year-old at home. And so the day after this uh, German national plan was announced, the city of Berlin, which is where I live, announced their plan, which included that daycares would re reopen normally starting in August. And uh, as a working parent, I can say that's quite far in the future. And I had, uh, you know, a personal uh, response. I was angry and frustrated, but also really looking at through the, this through the lens of gender justice and gender equity. Um, this is something that 
concerned me. So I mentioned I do uh, research in the area of climate. The UNFCCC Women and Gender Constituency has some nice criteria that they've put together to evaluate whether solutions and projects are gender just. One of which I'd like to highlight here that I think is quite helpful and informative. Um, a gender just solution aims to alleviate and or does not add additional burden to women's workload. And I think simply based on that criteria, we can say that if commerce um, and workplaces are reopening now, and uh, childcare is reopening four months later, that this cannot be considered gender just. Um, I think Nicole already mentioned, I think many of on the call would, are already aware that women do uh, a higher proportion of unpaid care work worldwide. This is also the case in Germany, of course, when childcare is closed and parents are expected to work. This affects both women and men, but it affects women disproportionately. Um, the good news is that in Germany, there has been lots of public debate on this. I uh, was not the only one to notice the inequities of this plan. And so the German government, as well as the Berlin government are working on proposals to open childcare. Before August, there have been alternate proposals to um, offset this burden if the decision is that for public health reasons that schools and childcare need to remain closed there have been suggestions to offer additional financial compensation to allow parents to organize some private child care so the situation is not all bad but I just I guess I would end with the comment that even you know in Germany we are living in a relatively wealthy and privileged society where in many areas, you know, gender equity is considered and valued, but in this case, uh, it seems to have been forgotten. One reason for this could be the representation issue. It's been well uh, reported in the media that this uh, committee of scientists at the Leopoldino, who's been advising the German government on the COVID response was made up of 26 scientists, two of whom were women and uh, with an average age of 60. So representation matters and that we also in Germany should be striving to live up to our ideals of gender equity also in um, crisis response. I've put together a little blog post on this. I hope it will be available on the Women Leaders for Planetary Health website soon. So I'd be happy if you read it and engage in a discussion about it. So thank you. Back to Martin. Thank you very much, Kathleen. And I hand over to Marka for another comment. So thank you, Martin. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. It's great pleasure to be here and also to have this opportunity to give a little bit of comment from my side. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm also one of the co-founders of uh, Women Leaders for Planetary Health. I'm former ISS fellow, and, uh, I'm public health um, professional by specialist, and my research at ISS was air pollution and health. So here um, today I would like to give this brief comment from two perspectives. One is from respiratory um, medicine perspective and namely global alliance to, uh, against uh, chronic respiratory diseases, which is a big alliance un under WHO comprising uh, um, respiratory health professionals from over 80 countries. So recently we drafted uh, um, the commentary, those all these professionals to be submitted to Lancet uh, Respiratory Health Journal. Um, uh, and I would like to uh, highlight the aspect we which is this commentary comprises of three aspects. It's for patients, for healthcare workers, and concerning um, communities and environmental um, uh, aspect of COVID-19 pandemic. So I would like to mainly highlight this aspect given the short time. Um, so as we know from February in, uh, and in March, many cities across the um, world launched these strategies to attempt to curtail the spread of COVID-19, and it included work from home and stay home, closure of schools and other public places. 
and cities all over the world now are observing uh, this record low levels of air pollution. For example, we know that the ambient levels of nitrogen dioxide in many cities, one of the main traffic related pollutants, have declined by 70 or 80 percent in Barcelona, 40 percent in London, 50 percent in New York and so on. So this short term reduction in air pollution is a positive news, obviously, out of this uh, bad news of pandemic, but uh, whether the short term if improvement will be associated with any significant health benefits remains to be seen. So this is what experts think and uh, nonetheless what's important that this demonstrated that abating uh, this air pollution is still achievable if everyone at every level be it individuals industries or governments band together so i think this is the important moment that we can bring out of this and um, also what is noteworthy for further um, 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 for drawing further conclusions is that during these unusual times of less air pollution and extreme measures to avoid transmission of respiratory viruses in general, there is clear decline in, there can be clear decline in morbidity and mortality due to respiratory diseases that are not related to COVID-19. Um, and um, so Basically, it's important to reinforce surveillance and proceed with early analysis of databases, which may demonstrate how much the population could benefit from a more rigorous um, control of air pollution and transmission of respiratory viruses in general. So this commentary also uh, included some of the action points um, uh, that um, Guard is proposing to the governments, and one of them is, of course, to inform, uh, enforce, um, to work on um, uh, sustaining this um, uh, re more rigorous air pollution abatement strategies, and also to um, working with the uh, universities to include air pollution and climate change topics into their curriculum. So this is briefly um, what I wanted to say about respiratory health and just two words about uh, gender dimensions on um, COVID-19 perspective. I think Nicole summarized it quite nicely in her presentations that, and what she pointed out that there are inequities which um, disproportionately affect um, uh, women and men in this context and the recently United Nations of Population Fund, just like two days ago, some of you might have seen, uh, also issued a report which highlighted quite alarming uh, numbers. Um, what they say is that number of women unable to access contraception and experience unintended pregnancies and face gender-based violence will skyrocket and I'll just give some of the numbers and I think numbers speak uh, a lot in this case. So. Um, it, uh, UNFPA predicts that over 47 million women could lose access to contraception, resulting in 7 million unplanned pregnancies if the lockdown continues for six months. And health facilities obviously will overrun by patients with the virus and leaving less space and time for women who seek uh, their reproductive health services. Report also predicts that 31 million additional gender-based violence cases can be expected over this coming months. Um, and obviously this will, uh, people from lower um, and middle income countries will be more affected. For example, um, if this um, um, disruption to prevention programs could result in additional 2 million female genital mutilation cases and 30 million childhood marriages. So I think this is something that we should also bear in mind and uh, I know this is just different perspectives what pandemic can bring and aggravate or just give us different perspectives to think about public health in general in different geographical contexts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marka. Mm -hmm. I'm hand over to you, Laura. Thank you. Um, so I'm Laura Jung. I'm uh, actually working with all of three organizations that are organizing the webinar tonight and uh, in particular with uh, Women in Global Health on female leadership in climate negotiations. And um, I just want to highlight that one question that always comes up when you start talking about gender um, in relation to 
either climate or global health security or many other important issues that we are discussing is why are we starting to talk about gender if we have actual problems? Like now we have to solve COVID, now we have to solve climate and gender might not be the priority. And I think this webinar is a good opportunity to show like why actually we need to talk about gender and why we need to talk about gender just solutions for those um, issues. Is it uh, a pandemic or is it climate change? And um, the reason for that is, as Nicole mentioned, often women are disproportionately affected by the consequences of, uh, of those issues. But there is also an issue with data collection. And often we kind of don't uh, collect gender disaggregated data. So we can't even say how much women are really affected. For climate, that is certainly true. For COVID, it's a bit more complicated. We obviously have the numbers um, of COVID-related deaths, and also we have that by gender. It's collected, for example, on a website called uh, Global Health 5050. There you can find that data from most, um, or like a lot of countries. But then for the other consequences, the more social, economical consequences, that are affecting women more than men, there we don't have this type of gender disaggregated data necessarily. So there is a gap when it comes to women's health and how much women are affected by those issues. And then the third, and that has also been highlighted, is that there is a lack of female voices in the decision-making processes. Um, and I'm just going to tell you for climate because I know that Mike is going to talk a bit more about COVID. But basically, we have looked at the last uh, COP, the World Climate uh, Conference, and we saw that uh, less than 40% of the party delegates were women, and also that less than 30% of the heads of delegations were women. So even so, we know that women are very hardly affected. They are then, in the end, not part of the people making the decisions and looking for the solutions. And that is especially for women from the global south that are even more affected and even more rarely part of the discussion and the decision-making processes. And that is for the climate space. And now I think Mike is going to continue and tell us a bit more on the COVID side of that. Thank you very much, Laura. So Mike, over to you. Um, so my name is Michael Foss. I am a researcher in the global uh, at the German Institute for International and um, Security Affairs, which is a, a Berlin-based think tank. And there, I focus on global health governance um, research. And now I have it in a second um, with a wonderful team. And I'm also a member of um, Women in Global Health, which is um, co-hosting this event. And it's an international organization and we have uh, chapters in several countries and I'm also a member in the German chapter. Perfect. So um, what I will be talking about is a feminist perspective on COVID-19. I will not talk so much about um, climate and climate policy. Um, I think we have heard a little bit um, of it. And as uh, Nicole said, gender and feminism is the linking element between um, health and uh, climate. And I, tr I want to um, stretch this a little bit more. Um, so what I did with uh, two other fantastic uh, female researchers is um, we wrote a paper on um, women in global health security and looking at feminist foreign policies. Um, this paper is forthcoming and I'm happy to share as soon as it, um, as it is possi uh, possible and published. And we came up with two hypotheses, uh, which is um, the first one is a narrow conceptualization of global health security tend to exclude women and gender issues. Um, we read uh, several global health uh, strategies by high-income countries where the, uh, the terms women, female, children, girls is not even mentioned. Um, so we looked at what kind of language do we have in these kind of policy papers. The other one is um, 
that we think that a lack of feminist approaches in health security policies negatively affects health system strengthening. So when women and children and um, girls are not visible, um, um, then we don't see policies made for their needs. Um, so we tried to come up with a tool um, with a feminist lens um, that helps us to expose the invisibilities of women in global health security. And I am happy to share like our preliminary um, results. Um, so we applied a feminist lens and also a health um, equity lens on several documents and several policies. And what we find was that a feminist lens in global health policies, as I said, deconstructs um, um, traditional global health narratives and practices. So we can, when we look through a feminist lens, we see um, the, the old way of framing global health around infectious diseases and not around the needs of um, women, girls, boys, health uh, and, their, and their health. Um, when we use a feminist lens in the most powerful and most famous um, global health security instrument, the international health regulations, we see a big need for gender sensitive norm setting. Also the words uh, women, um, female are not mentioned in, the, in this uh, document. And when we use a health equity lens in feminist foreign policies, um, for example, in the Swedish or the Canadian or the Mexican feminist policy, we see promising, uh, promising uh, co-benefits for health and security policies. So feminist foreign policies, which we have from, um, from a handful of uh, countries, um, we think that this is also an instrument for health policy making. And I think um, this is um, some, uh, I find it very interesting that we, that we talk about co-benefits also here, what we are more used to when we talk about um, health and climate policies. And the last one, health equity lens in security policies. Here we looked at the UN Security Council re resolution on women, uh, peace and security. Um, this is actually a place, um, a security policy looking at females um, and uh, women and uh, girls, where prevention and health promotion can be seen. And this for us is also an ankle where resilient health system strengthening can take place. And of course, we can also add a lens for, um, for environmental policies, for example, but it's just more the shoes we step in to look at other policies. And I think this is um, just an example of we can use the different perspectives as a tool. Um, one organization that makes this uh, shifting uh, perspective very, very nicely is uh, Women in Global Health. Um, that started um, uh, a new campaign on global health security and uh, the, the role of women called um, Operation 5050. Uh, Laura just uh, told us about it a little bit. And um, they came up um, with five big asks. So I would say these five big asks are the feminist approach to the COVID-19 response. The first one is, and we talked a little bit about it, equal re re representation in decision-making bodies and um, scientific um, councils, uh, um, council um, representation. Um, we just started um, to collect data in a crowdsourcing uh, format I'm happy to, to uh, send information on this, or you can find also information on the Twitter um, account on women and global health, where we try to get our data on the representation of national task force for the COVID-19 response to make, uh, to, to increase uh, transparency, and then also to nicely and kindly ask uh, governments to maybe think again of equal representation. The second one is safe and decent work uh, conditions, um, especially for females in the COVID-19 response. Um, um, more than 70% of uh, the workforce is female and um, females are also um, especially um, vulnerable in the, uh, in the response due to, for example, um, personal uh, protective equipment that is not uh, fitting their body sizes. 
Um, this third one is fair pay and shared unpaid work. Um, we, talk, we heard about it from Kathleen. Um, the, the burden for childcare often lies on the women's uh, shoulders, and this is also um, something that women in global health tackles here. Um, the fourth one is a little bit what Laura already said um, when it comes to data collection and data analysis. We need uh, disaggregated data to have a gender responsive approach in the COVID-19 response. And the fifth one, a well-funded organization, um, especially women's movements and women's organizations um, everywhere, but especially where um, shrinking space, spaces is an uh, is a ongoing trend. And COVID-19, of course, also um, gets a lot of attention and other um, needed Organiza uh, organizations that need also attention and um, investment and money um, lacks attention. Um, so this is uh, a little overview of the five asks and um, the, the German chapter in, in Germany of Women in Global Health is very uh, welcome to uh, get new members on board. Um, please follow us on, on Twitter or look at uh, our website. Um, we are happy to, to uh, co-host any further uh, webinars and um, thanks for, for this discussion.